Good evening, everyone. I'm Johan here. Um, for logistic wise, you know, for optimal experience for tonight's lecture, please select speaker view in the top right corner of your screen. Likewise, there will be a Q&A after Dr. Joseph's lecture, but at any point during the lecture, please feel free to submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, as you know, also, we are dependent on the generosity of our community to fulfill our mission. So please consider making a donation to SAMA via text. I will put that information in the chat box to you all. Now, here is um, Bella Merriam, the 18T Director of Education, Diversity and Inclusion. Hello, everybody. I'd like to start tonight's program by sharing our land acknowledgement with you. The San Antonio Museum of Art is mindful of its location on the ancestral lands of the first peoples of this area, including Eshtokna, Carrizo Comacrudo tribe of Texas, the Tehuan Band of Mission Indians, the Tatpilam Quahil Tecan Nation, and the many other local native peoples whose names and contributions have been erased over time, including migratory peoples of Simanahuac. We also remember those of indigenous descent who continue to migrate as an ancestral right that predates imposed borders. The San Antonio Museum of Art recognizes the many diverse autochthonous peoples still connected to this sacred land and living creation and all walks of life as inhabitants of the sky, earth and water along the Yanawana River. We pay our highest respects to these communities and honor their histories, continued presence and legacies in San Antonio as a means of recognizing the truth and complexity of this Somasek vast lands history. It is an honor for me to introduce tonight's distinguished Neil Joseph. Dr. Joseph is the Barbara Jordan Chair in Ethics and Political Values at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and Professor of History and the Founding Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at the University of Texas at Austin. He is a frequent national commentator on issues of anti-racism, democracy, and civil rights. Dr. Joseph has written several books on African-American history, including The Sword and the Shield, and Stokely, A Life. His book, The Sword and the Shield, is the topic of tonight's lecture and conversation, and it was named as one of Time Magazine's 100 Must Read Books of 2020. Dr. Joseph lives in Austin, Texas, and we are honored to have him here with us virtually tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peniel Joseph. <laughs> Thank you, Bella. Thank you, Johanna, for, for organizing this in the San Antonio um, Museum of Art for organizing this. Um, I want to talk really just for about 20 minutes. Um, I don't want to, uh, I want to get a robust conversation and back and forth. Uh, in about uh, the, the sword and the shield, the revolutionary lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. I could not have possibly known when I was writing this book that 2020 would turn out to be uh, the way it, it, it turned out and that 2021 would turn out to be this way. So the interest uh, I think in the book and in work around racial justice and uh, Black history um, has just exploded. You know, um, you know, things on the bestsellers list are the expertise of so many uh, scholars, activists, uh, civil rights leaders um, have been called upon in the aftermath of uh, George Floyd's uh, murder last year. Uh, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, the COVID-19 pandemic that is ongoing, but the racial disparities of that pandemic, uh, the most divisive election, uh, racially divisive presidential election in American history. And then of course, um, you know, the three Wednesdays in January, but also a Tuesday when we think about Warnock and Ossoff uh, in Georgia and Reverend Raphael Warnock making history in Georgia and then the, the riot at the, the Capitol, uh, the U US Capitol, the second impeachment of, of a sitting president for the first time in American history. And then of course, the, the Biden-Harris uh, inauguration that also made history with Kamala, Kamala Harris um, being the first black woman VP in, in American history. Um, so uh, the sword in the shield really looks at America's um, second reconstruction. We sometimes call it the civil rights black power period. 
Uh, I think that we are, you know, in the midst of America's third reconstruction right now. And what the Sword and the Shield does is really push back against conventional interpretations of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. We usually think of Malcolm X as the political sword of the time. We usually think of him as somebody who was violent or calling for violence, uh, somebody who perhaps was anti-white, somebody who was much more militant, much more radical than King, who's perceived as, uh, you know, America's apostle of nonviolence. Uh, King is, sealed, is, is seen as that nonviolent shield in contrast to Malcolm's uh, violent political sword. And really in the sword and the shield, I, I through, through constructing a dual biography of their lives, a political uh, and intellectual biography of their lives, um, what I do is really push back against that just based on the evidence of how the history that they participated in unfolded. So we, we see a Malcolm X who, uh, yes, is an advocate of self-defense, but is a much more subtle and complex figure than he's usually given credit for, somebody who wants to take the civil rights movement uh, into the arena of human rights, um, somebody who pushes back against uh, the Vietnam War even before Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, somebody who I call Black America's prosecuting attorney who's prosecuting white America for a series of crimes against Black humanity that date back to racial slavery. Uh, Malcolm, in addition to his famous a house Negro versus field Negro analogy uh, in, his, in his speeches and rhetoric um, is often given seminars on American history. So Malcolm X is, is, is the boldest critic of white supremacy in the 20th century. He's the most important black working class leader ever produced. And what's so important for us about Malcolm is that many of his criticisms of American democracy resonate uh, perhaps more in our time now uh, than they did even in his. Um, and Malcolm famously said American democracy was nothing but uh, American hypocrisy. And he said this because of the gap between the rhetoric of American democracy and the lack of citizenship, the lack of citizenship status for black people. Malcolm argued for uh, radical black dignity uh, and, and that idea of radical black dignity, Malcolm defined it as uh, ending world white supremacy. So Malcolm wouldn't have just defined the riot at the nation's capital as a white supremacist uh, act. He also thought about American foreign and domestic policy in the, in the realm of white supremacy, how it impacted Africa, how it impacted the Middle East and the third world. Um, and when we think about Malcolm and this notion of black dignity, that notion of black dignity predates the classical period of the Black Power Movement. So he's talking about radical social, political, economic, cultural self-determination, and he both criticizes white supremacy, but he also has a critique of Black people because Malcolm had been in prison for seven years. His mother had been institutionalized uh, in a psychiatric hospital uh, for most of his adult life. His father had been killed at an, at an early age. He always conceived of it as his father being the victim of white violence. Um, even as um, his family did not believe that, uh, but that shaped his perception and his family were, were activists, they were Garveyites. Uh, they had been threatened in Omaha, Nebraska and Wisconsin and Michigan by white supremacists. So Malcolm was shaped by the lower frequencies of American society and he never forgot that. Uh, you know, in contrast, in terms of King, I say that King was Black America's um, defense attorney. King is defending Black lives to white Americans, and he's defending white souls to Black Americans. And what I mean by that is that he's making an argument that Black people do not want some kind of uh, racial or political reckoning in the context of revenge. They just want access to American society on an equal footing. But he also has to convince Black people that all the anti-Black racism and violence and white supremacy uh, does not mean that somehow white people are inherently intrinsically bad. So when we think about the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, King's organization, their slogan, their motto to redeem the soul of America is really important here. This idea that America was this morally reprehensible, politically indefensible nation, but Black people needed to organize around principles 
of, of nonviolence. What's important about King is King is arguing for radical black citizenship. And King defines citizenship as not just the absence of racial oppression, but as the visible appearance of justice. And he defines that justice as decent housing, a universal basic income, uh, racial integration in neighborhoods and schools, and the end of state structured violence. And that violence is connected to law enforcement, but it's also connected to poverty and also war. So King is a really extraordinary figure in that way. And one of the things that the Sword and the Shield argues is that over time, Malcolm and Martin come to realize that you need black citizenship and dignity. That's what's so extraordinary. So they start off as adversaries uh, turned rivals uh, who become each other's alter egos in a lot of ways. By 1963, Malcolm is radicalized by events that are happening in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, he's in Washington, DC uh, and New York as, as temporary head of Muslim Mosque number four. Um, he's speaking to representatives in Congress. He is um, trying to lobby uh, for social and political change and transformation, not just from Harlem, but from the nation's capital. So even as he's critical of Dr. King and what's going on in Birmingham, and he famously says that Black people have a right to defend themselves against four-legged dogs and two-legged dogs, because remember, uh, nonviolent peaceful demonstrators were being attacked by law enforcement in Birmingham, Alabama with German shepherds and fire hoses that were powerful enough to strip the bark off of trees. So Birmingham becomes such a global crisis that we have international newspapers and French papers calling white Americans in Birmingham savages. That's the headline, that's the lead. They're calling them sauvage because of what they're doing. So this is before Selma, this is not the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but it's certainly after white riots in Oxford, Mississippi in 1962, when James Meredith becomes the first black student to enroll at Mississippi, which leaves uh, several people dead. And it's certainly after white mobs uh, rioting uh, during the Freedom Rides in Anniston, Alabama and other places. And it's certainly after, again, white mobs and white violence um, uh, physically attacking and assaulting peaceful sit-in demonstrators in 1960. Uh, and certainly it's after, again, white mobs, 1957, Little Rock Central High School, uh, 1,500 uh, white racial terrorists, uh, including young teenagers, uh, threatening uh, black students who are trying to desegregate Little Rock Central High School. So from Malcolm X's perspective, the United States was morally and politically irredeemable because of those anecdotes that I've just given. It wasn't about uh, somehow those were aspects of progress. Malcolm looked at that as a deeply deep, a deep, deep indictment on the idea of American democracy that black lives mattered so little that all that violence could be waged against black people who were just looking for dignity uh, and citizenship. Uh, but, but over time, in the aftermath of Birmingham, in the aftermath of his split from the Nation of Islam, Malcolm in The Ballad or the Bullet talks about voting rights and uh, a political revolution. And so when we think about Malcolm in real time by 1964, his only meeting with Dr. King is March 26, 1964 at the US Senate, when the Senate is filibustering the 1964 Civil Rights Act that is eventually passed on July 2nd, that's going to uh, end racial segregation in public accommodations. Malcolm is there in support of the Civil Rights Act and that's where they meet. Dr. King, of course, is in support of the Civil Rights Act. But that same year, Malcolm tells Robert Penn Warren, the journalist, that him and Dr. King have the same goals and their goals are human dignity, but they have different tactics. Uh, Malcolm famously goes to Cairo uh, he takes the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca in April and May of 64, but he's at Cairo by July Organization of African Unity Conference, and he's making these inroads. Malcolm had access to an office at the United Nations. Malcolm famously is the person who politicized Cassius Clay on his way to becoming Mal Muhammad Ali. So Malcolm really is going to transform a whole generation of, of Negroes and Negro Americans 
uh, into Black Americans uh, and, and African Americans and, and folks who are Black people who are proud of Africa and proud of their history, a history that predates racial slavery uh, in the United States. Uh, when we think about King and King's uh, impact on Malcolm, we can see in 64 and 65, we're gonna see King's, uh, Malcolm's impact on King really after Malcolm's assassination. Malcolm also in December of 1964 is in Harlem when Dr. King is making a speech in the aftermath of winning the Nobel Peace Prize. And Malcolm is there sitting next to An Andrew Young, one of King's key lieutenants and a future mayor of Atlanta and congressman and United Nations ambassador. And when we think about Malcolm, Malcolm a few days later talks about the speech that King made. He speaks approvingly of that. And by February, Malcolm is in Selma uh, to meet with Dr. King. Dr. King's in prison and he meets with Coretta Scott King and Andy Young again and tells Coretta Scott King how much he admires uh, her husband and how, how he's trying to be part of the solution. And he wants people to know there's an alternative to Dr. King if black people don't get voting rights and black political power and economic power in the United States. And so when you think about Malcolm X and King, we see this convergence. Uh, when we think about King, the final three years of King's life is the King that we, we often don't wanna talk about. It's really a King who is um, uh, uh, a radical. He's always nonviolent. He's a revolutionary. He's speaking truth to power in the aftermath of Watts Los Angeles. <laughs> Excuse me for one second. Yeah, excuse me, that's my, my, my daughter. Um, so when we think about Dr. King, the radical king, the revolutionary king is speaking truth to power in the aftermath of Watts Los Angeles and the urban rebellion in Watts. Uh, he's marching alongside of Stokely Carmichael in Greenwood, Mississippi. He has um, criticism of aspects of black power but he embraces black power's notion of radical political and economic self-determination. Uh, the Revolutionary King comes out uh, on April 4th, 1967 at the Riverside Church in New York City. And he says that the United States of America is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. He says it's gonna be a bitter but beautiful struggle to try to transform American democracy. What's so extraordinary about Dr. King in the last three years of his life, he is utilizing nonviolent civil disobedience as a political sword in the same manner that, that Malcolm X had, had suggested after the March on Washington. Malcolm had famously called the March on Washington a farce on Washington because he felt that the demonstration should have paralyzed the city until uh, really like the prophet Amos, justice rolled down like a mighty stream uh, in, in the United States of America. Uh, by 1966, 67, 68, King is no longer gonna be on speaking terms with presidents He's not gonna be within the mainstream. He's gonna come out as somebody who's anti-imperialist, anti-racist, but yes, anti-racial capitalism, anti-capitalism as well, at least the neoliberal capitalism that we have, which leaves so many uh, tens of millions of people uh, without food, without shelter, uh, who, who are hungry uh, in the richest nation in the world. So uh, the, the anecdote I'll close with with Dr. King is that uh, when King is organizing the Poor People's Campaign in 1968, and it's going to be multiracial, uh, he's going to have poor whites from Appalachia, uh, indigenous, but he starts uh, from Marks, Mississippi, the poorest zip code uh, in the United States, and he is in tears listening to poor Black folks in Marks who are talking about the fact that their children don't have uh, shoes, they don't have blankets when it's cold, they don't have enough food. And Dr. King says to them that the way they are living in Marx, Mississippi is a crime and that they're gonna go and really occupy Washington DC until this situation is transformed. That language of crime 
calling it a crime is exactly the same language as Malcolm X. But Dr. King goes, goes on. He says, he talks about racial slavery and reconstruction. He talks about the fact that black people were promised 40 acres and a mule during reconstruction, but instead received nothing and, and were, were discriminated against and criminalized. And he says, in contrast, uh, whites and European immigrants were provided millions of free acres of land through the Homestead Act. And not only did they get free land, they got an infrastructure and land agents and, and uh, agronomists who helped them uh, cultivate the earth and, and, and utilize uh, the land to, to, to build themselves up. And he says that this is the same group of people who are now telling you to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. And I think that's really extraordinary because King starts to uh, utilize and traffic uh, in some of the, the same uh, historical analogies that, that Malcolm did his whole career. And when we think about King's assassination on April 4th, 1968, Thursday, April 4th, 1968, 6 p.m. Memphis time at the Lorraine Motel on the balcony, which is now a civil rights museum, King is helping to organize over 1,000 uh, striking sanitation workers, and they're on strike for a living wage. So the revolutionary King and the revolutionary Malcolm X, they go hand in hand. In this age of Black Lives Matter, uh, most of what we think of as new is connected to the movements that Malcolm and Martin talked about. They talked about intersectional issues, and we now talk about intersectional identity and intersectional issues, meaning that um, as we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, all intersectionality acknowledges is that the pandemic has affected all of us differently. Some people have died. Some people have been unable to work. Some people have been left homeless. Uh, and, and this is based on race, class, gender, um, sexuality, uh, so many different other things, mental health status, uh, able-bodied status, all these different things. And that's what intersectional identity helps us with. Intersectional uh, political issues braid uh, the local, the regional, the domestic, the national together. It connects criminal justice to the environment. It connects uh, racial segregation in public schools and neighborhoods to the wealth gap and the income gap. Uh, it connects uh, violence against black bodies to larger structures and systems, both in America and globally. And that's what Malcolm and Martin did. And now we've got uh, Black Lives Matter uh, doing it, um, uh, really utilizing the theorizing of radical Black feminist uh, theorists and organizers, radical Black queer feminist theorists and organizers, um, and, and building uh, an even bigger, uh, more transformative call for justice. Uh, but I would, I would close, I've got my little timer here, I'd close by saying what's extraordinary about Malcolm and Martin uh, is the way in which they conceptualize freedom and liberation through these themes of black dignity and citizenship that we are still struggling for today, right? And they, they conceptualize this in a panoramic way. They were interested in criminal justice. Uh, they were interested in poverty. Uh, they were interested in foreign policy, domestic policy, and they were both theorists of democracy. So what's really extraordinary for us in, in 2021 is that the, 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 their legacies are living legacies. Dr. King's call for us to build a beloved community that was free of racial injustice and free of economic injustice. Malcolm X's call for us to turn the civil rights movement into a human rights movement where all uh, human beings on the planet had dignity uh, and, and King's call for citizenship. Those are really the, the, um, the dual um, context for uh, liberation struggles right here in our own time. And, and the challenge for the future of democracy rests on whether or not we're able to achieve dignity and citizenship for all people, but, but, but we get to the universal through the particular struggle uh, and history of, of Black people in America. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Joseph. Um, let's just get into the Q&A. So our <laughs> okay, um, our first question is, oh, hello again. <laughs> um, 
In the midst of ongoing racial division in this country, there seems to be a clarion call for unity. What work has to be done for this to be realized? And how did Dr. King and Malcolm X view unity? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I've written about this for um, CNN and other outlets about a call for a national racial truth, justice, and healing commission. And, and before you can get to unity, you have to acknowledge, uh, you know, 74 million people voted for the last president. And the last president was um, a white supremacist, an authoritarian, um, a sexist, uh, somebody who was anti-Black, but also anti-human in a lot of ways. So it's going to be difficult to have unity with that with that group of with that group of people. I'll, I'll be right there. Um, it's going to be difficult to have unity with that group of people. So when we think about um, unity, what what we would need for unity is truth and and having a basis, a shared basis for uh, understanding um, both American history from 1776 to the present and 1619 to the present and not thinking because we talk about our, our flaws uh, that we somehow hate the country. So because we talk about uh, racial slavery, because we talk about white supremacy, we somehow um, hate the country. So the only way to get to unity uh, in a meaningful way is that we talk about uh, racial injustice, we talk about economic injustice, um, and we, we say that we can't have a democracy when half the country doesn't believe in democracy. So when you see the, 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 the riot at the nation's capital, when you see these things, they're trying to overturn the votes of, of black people uh, in, in the United States. They're trying to overturn the votes of folks in Atlanta, in Detroit, in Milwaukee and other places through force. And there's a real historical context for this. This happened not necessarily, uh, not necessarily an assault at the nation's capital, but this happened during reconstruction. This happened during um, the, the civil rights era in the period of, of the second reconstruction too, where we saw organized white violence um, against uh, black voting rights, black citizenship and black dignity. So we're in a wash, rinse, repeat moment uh, right now. And so the calls for unity cannot be at the expense of Black people and Black citizenship and, and, and dignity. And we've seen the unequal criminal justice response uh, to the white rioters in contrast to even peaceful Black Lives Matter demonstrators. Thank you. Our next question is, um, as a nation, where we are now, what do you think as a museum that we can do in a pragmatic form rather than idealist? Yeah, I'm, I'm dealing with my... Uh... It's understandable. <laughs> so let's see. I love you. Bye, I love you. <laughs> yes, can you, Johanna, can you repeat this? I know. Can you, can you repeat the um, question? Yeah. For sure. Um, as a nation where we are now, what do you think as a museum can we do in a pragmatic form rather than idealist? Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, I think, I think part of it is people are doing it. I mean, I think at the local level, we should be thinking about reimagining public safety. Um, the calls to defund the police are actually accurate ones and correct ones. And all that means is, doesn't mean you're not gonna have any cops. It means that you are, you, we need dramatic structural reform in the criminal justice system. The calls to abolish policing, you know, this is not um, uh, imaginary or calls to abolish prisons. It's not imaginary. It's like what needs to be done because we're spending so much money on, um, law enforcement, we spend so much money on military, we spend so much money providing tax cuts and tax breaks for the wealthiest people. We don't even have a public uh, health uh, infrastructure that allows for, for a supply chain for the COVID-19 pandemic vaccine even, right? People are seeing all around the country, there are tens of millions of people who want the vaccine, uh, but who can't get it, right? Because uh, local um, state and local municipalities don't have the infrastructure. This is connected to 
uh, food injustice. And there's 37, 40 million Americans uh, a day who go uh, food insecure. This is connected to homelessness and housing affordability. It's connected to the fact that our prisons are warehouses for people who are mentally ill. So all these different things are connected together. So I think the, the, the pragmatic thing we should be doing is um, calling for at the local level, the reallocation of our tax dollars to be invested in ending housing affordability, housing inaffordability, uh, ending um, uh, you know, bad outcomes between police and citizens, um, ending uh, food injustice, uh, ending all these issues that are connected to racial oppression, just even at the local level, right? Um, at the national level, you know, the George Floyd and Policing Act uh, has some reforms, but it really doesn't go far enough. I think the, the stimulus package that's being proposed and seems it might get through through reconciliation is a good thing. I think uh, alleviating student debt, uh, transforming the criminal justice system, having a John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act that, that ends voting suppression, those are all things that we should be focusing on at the pragmatic level. And remember, no matter what you call it, in the United States, there's always opposition to justice. Abolishing slavery was unpopular, just like defund the police. I just want everybody to know on the call, on the Zoom call, when you said, let's abolish slavery in 1850, okay, in 1840, 1830, people didn't like it. White people didn't like it because white people are invested in white supremacy. They are invested in it. They're invested in it, right? Whether or not they admit it, it's irrelevant. That's the whole thing. So uh, the fact that the president finally mentioned white supremacy and we're understanding white supremacy is a threat to American democracy is really important, but it doesn't go far enough, right? Because you have to say, well, what are we gonna do about it? And part of getting to that racial truth, justice and healing is for us all to be uh, as best as we can on the same page about our reality, right? And way before we had QAnon, you had the same kind of conspiracy theories during Reconstruction and saying that Black folks were taking over state houses in South Carolina, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, and the same people who were lying about Black people then, same as they're doing right now. And what they did with the lies, just like the white riot at the U.S. Capitol, they murdered and slaughtered tens of thousands of Black people between 1865 and the late 19th century. This is more than the 6,500 lynchings that Brian Stevenson and EGI National Memorial have, have documented. This is more. There's a lot more pain. There's a lot more trauma. So part of it is all of us collectively uh, uh, educating ourselves, understanding what that means, and, and trying to um, achieve a different country, right? Because people can become very, very um, hopeless and cynical when they find out that history, uh, I think they, they should not. But the only way we can confront that history and actually get to the other side where we can see some hope and optimism is by um, facing that history. And the United States has done everything it could in its power to not face that history. Um, our next question is, you refer to both of these leaders as revolutionary. Do you think there are any contemporary Black revolutionaries? Oh yeah, many. You know, the organizers of Black Lives Matter, when we think about Opal Tometi, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, when you think about Tamika Mallory, when you think about No Name, uh, I like Megan The Stallion. I, I, I like, I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't have a, when people are these strong uh, political and cultural figures, I love it. Uh, Reverend William Barber, Sherilyn Eiffel of the Legal Defense Fund. Um, there's, there's, we have a cascade in embarrassment of, of riches when it comes to uh, revolutionary leaders. And they're all interested in fundamental human rights. You know, they, these are folks who are uh, uh, critical of what we've done with immigrants and cages and ICE. Uh, they're critical of violence against Black women. Uh, they're critical of structural violence and poverty and homelessness. They're critical of uh, the bad maternal health outcomes of Black women. Black children have uh, more likelihood to have lead poisoning, to have asthma, uh, to be uh, victims of environmental racism and injustice. Uh, they're critical of 
uh, the way in which the agriculture department and uh, Tom Vilsack and the secretary of agriculture, the new one, how they've mistreated black farmers historically and how black farmers uh, have had land taken away, have had privileges taken away, never have had the same equal access as white farmers and that continues into 2021. So I think that we have an extraordinary generation of leaders. And if anything, I think the pushback, especially against BLM 1.0 uh, in 2014, 2013, after Michael Brown and after Trayvon Martin, you know, it was, it was a disgraceful pushback, but this is the same country that, again, opposed not just black power, but opposed civil rights, opposed women's suffrage, uh, opposed the Equal Rights Amendment for women, uh, opposed gay marriage. Um, so we, we, have, we have a hard history. And I think that instead of confronting that history, we're more used to lying about that history, right? And so it's important for us to remember that. You know, I'm writing something on third reconstruction now in this period and how I conceptualize it that deals with the second and the first reconstructions. But th this country is based on two big lies, right? The lie of American exceptionalism is that uh, black people were not human. They were this species of property. They were contraband. They could be assaulted and raped and killed and murdered and abused and demonized and dehumanized forever. That's why a civil war was fought where 100,000 people died, over 700,000 people died rather, and the United States of America became this republic of suffering, right? But the, the, the second lie is that the first lie never happened, right? So that, that's what we do. So even when we get to reconstruction, when the Freedmen's Bureau is inaugurated, white people start complain, complaining about the Freedmen's Bureau, just like they would later complain about affirmative action, as if the Freedmen's Bureau was granting special privileges to black people who had been enslaved, right? So that's the nonsense that we've uh, faced in this country in perpetuity, in perpetuity. So when people keep talking now, right-wingers at times, about a second civil war, um, and Joe Biden, President Biden said that, you know, this, this uncivil war must stop. Uh, for black people, it never stopped because the North won the civil war and the South and the white supremacists and the Trumpers and the MAGAites and the QAnons, they won the peace. They won the peace. That's why you have the lost cause. That's why you have the racist textbooks up until this moment. New York Times had a story today. How come there's so few black economists at the Fed? Racism. I can give you. I can give you the answer. The New York Times. You know, white supremacy. New York Times, and you all are a part of it. New York Times. You know what I mean? You know. So it's it's, and that's why Stokely, one of my heroes who I've written about, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, he called for Black Power because he's saying we had to define this, and obviously Malcolm did too. And King, at the end, King is saying that uh, the halls of American Congress are running wild with racism. Dr. King is telling the American Psychological Association that it's, it's white folks who are producing chaos in the United States in 1967. And he's telling them that white folks are lying about the chaos that they produce and say, if not, but for the chaos that they're producing, there'd be racial peace. That's what I'm saying. So, I mean, we, Dr. King, remember, Dr. King tells us, he says, we're a sick society, a society that's sick with the cancer of racism. But he says, I'm the physician diagnosing the disease. I didn't call it. I didn't cause it. Right. So that's what we're facing. That's what we're facing. Right. And a lot of people um, don't ever want to uh, confront all of this. Right. It's hard. Right. It's hard. And again, if white people are finding it hard, you can imagine how black people are finding this. That's what that's what I say. You know, if white people say, this is so hard for me to understand privilege. I'm so hard. My feelings are hurt. I just can't believe it. I can't believe it. Right. Imagine being black in this nightmare. OK. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Um, I had to have like a follow up personal question because, you know, in South Africa, when they rewrote their constitution, they went through the truth and Re reconciliation kind of stages yet. And their constitution is quite liberal. Right. But those realities still aren't with uh, the people of South Africa. So I'm kind of interested in that disconnect if you if you know more about it. Yeah, I think South Africa did a truth and reconciliation committee, but one of the, they did really good things. They did good things. But one of the, I thought the flaws of South Africa's truth and reconciliation uh, uh, process 
was that it was too individualized and personalized. And so it, it, they, because they were trying to build up a new interracial democracy, they really did not have perhaps maybe the, the, the experience and in, in, in a, a context to uh, turn that truth and reconciliation into something that was systemic and substantive in that way, right? And so you still end up with vast white economic power and sort of black political power in South Africa in a way that does not trickle down to the folks who live in the Bantu stands in South Africa. I spent a month in South Africa uh, in 2001, World Conference Against Racism. I got a chance to talk and build uh, like Walter Rod Rodney groundings with my, my sisters and brothers in South Africa. And so they're really, uh, really, it's a flawed process. So any process we do here has to be connected to reparations, uh, uh, but to, to repair economically, to end the wealth gap. Uh, you know, it, it's got to be connected to policy transformations and structural transformations. And again, that has to be at the local and the state, the regional, the national level, but everybody's in on it. Private companies have to be connected to this. Universities uh, have been part of the supply chain of white supremacy, including University of Texas at Austin, where I, where I uh, work. And, and really, you know, like Frederick Douglass reminds us, uh, you know, power concedes nothing without demand. It never has, it never will. So you've got to make these demands, you know, and that's what both Malcolm and Martin were doing in their lifetimes. Thank you. Um, uh, so this person, said, I see Dr. Eddie Gloud's book about James Baldwin yeah. over your shoulder. I realize that I don't know anything about Baldwin's relationship with either Dr. King or Malcolm X. Could you talk about that? Yeah, you know, James Baldwin is, you know, black queer genius uh, who's, who's uh, lives from 1924 to 1987, um, Harlem born. Stepfather was a preacher who was very, very emotionally abusive to Jimmy. Uh, uh, Baldwin is a, a writer of incredible talent who leaves for France in the late 1940s, but returns to the United States in the late 50s uh, periodically and sort of then starts to stay in the early 60s and becomes very much radicalized uh, by the civil rights movement, by the black power movements and becomes this radical witness uh, of, of uh, both the possibilities and promise of American democracy and also its frailties, its vulgarities, its um, defamation at the hands of, of white supremacy. And so when you think about The Fire Next Time is published in 1963, the book that sort of makes Jimmy this household name and gets a meeting with Bobby Kennedy and Malcolm X had first met him in 61. He had first met Dr. King around 57, 58. Uh, he also was friends with Meg Grevers, the civil rights hero from Mississippi, who was murdered on June 12th by a racial terrorist who wasn't put in prison until the 1990s. So his relationship with King and Malcolm is, is a good one. You know, they respect him, they value him. Uh, he's going to have a good relationship with Angela Davis, Stokely Carmichael, Black Panthers. But with Malcolm and Martin, no, he's close. Uh, he, he appears on programs with them. He helps them fundraise. Um, so, you know, they admire him and he admires them. Uh, after Malcolm is killed, Baldwin, uh, Jimmy writes a screenplay that is never produced uh, for a, a film that Hollywood was gonna make about, about Malcolm X uh, in the 60s starring Billy D. Williams. Um, you know, famously he talks about uh, his relationship with Martin and Malcolm in a great Esquire article that I, that I quote from in the epilogue uh, from 1973, he talks about their relationship. And, and there's a great uh, documentary, Who Speaks for the Negro by Raoul Peck, um, uh, the Haitian uh, filmmaker and documentarian um, that looks at Baldwin and his relationship with just the 60s, but also with Martin and Malcolm and how he was, he was wanting to write a book about the, the deaths of Malcolm, Martin, and Medgar Evers, but he never did. The closest he comes is the book No Name in the Street, which really uh, is this incredible book. And that's what Eddie Gloud and his incredible book Begin, Begin Again uh, riffs on is No Name in the Street and how, how the deaths of all these people had shattered Baldwin and how he's trying to make himself whole and come, come to understand 
uh, what 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 Eddie Gloud calls after following uh, uh, Whitman the aftertimes of you know the post civil rights era where you know white supremacy has run rampant you know like what we're seeing now with the capital assault is really connected to Reaganism it's connected to uh, 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 Barry Goldwater and George Wallace uh, it's connected to um, you know, fighting these fights, but losing the war, you know, losing. And the war continues, but you're losing when you have Ronald Reagan, you're losing when you have mass incarceration, you're losing when you have um, uh, folks who are freedom fighters who are languishing as political prisoners, you're losing when people go into exile, uh, you're, you're, you're losing when, um, uh, you know, white folks are medicalized for the opioid crisis and black folks are thrown away like human garbage, right? And so um, Baldwin really deals with the loss, you know, he deals with the loss squarely. And I think that's why um, he has a good relationship with Malcolm and Martin because they're dealing with it squarely too. So all three of those folks um, are not interested in lying about the reality of, of American society and global society. Um, our next question is, do you think Dr. King and Malcolm X would view the hoarding of COVID vaccines by the global North, uh, wealthy Western countries to be an act of racism, nationalism, or both? No, I would say that they would see it as part of racial capitalism, you know, racism and capitalism, uh, racial capitalism, big term, just in terms of just historically, you know, capitalism globally was fueled by not just anti-Black racism, but by racial slavery. And so the structures of racial capitalism, which we still have in the NFL, we have in the White House, we have everywhere, it means that Black people do all the work, um, get scapegoated, get imprisoned, get shot, uh, 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 win you Super Bowls, and you accrue the value. That, that's what it means, you know? So even Henrietta Lacks, the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks, Tuskegee experiment, we can be experimented on, we can be dehumanized, we can be used, whether it's defund the police or Willie Horton to scare white folks in the suburbs to give police unions billions of dollars. And remember the police unions all supported Trump and that means the police unions are white supremacists, right? That's what, I, you know, so when Obama was saying the other day, hey, you know, we shouldn't say defund the police, you're losing potential friends. What he didn't say is that, hey, those cops who supported uh, uh, Trump are racist and shouldn't be policing me, right? You know what I mean? Like he didn't say that, right? Because again, Obama was a president. So you could say he was a great president. He's not a prophet. And that's what Martin Luther King Jr. was. So Dr. King, for those of us who are Christians, we've read the Bible multiple times. So you remember Jeremiah and Amos, and you know what the Jericho road is, and you know Saul turning into Paul on the road to Damascus. That's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So he can speak truth to power, and Malcolm X had been speaking truth to power even before Dr. King. Malcolm defined America as a searing racial wilderness when Dr. King was just trying to bite and nibble at the edges because King thought you could reform this. Malcolm realized that we were in the belly of the beast, right? And that, that it was black labor that had built up all this wealth, right? And so Malcolm, right, he calls uh, uh, he calls out names. So what Malcolm says, he says, you can't put a knife in a person's back nine inches, take it out six inches and call that progress. Malcolm said, you haven't taken out the knife, you haven't even acknowledged the wounds, right? So the reason why um, uh, Malcolm X is not popular with white folks is that Malcolm X called out white supremacy. That's why the state of Georgia right now is trying to silence educators who call out white supremacy because Georgia, Stone Mountain, the, the home of the rebirth Klan, 1915, Georgia, which is a national embarrassment, right? Georgia is a white supremacist state. So of course they don't want, right? They don't want people saying, hey, you know what? You all are what? White supremacists, <laughs> right? They don't want to say that, right? So for all the people out there, it's like the, the, the biggest way to get white folks angry is to say, you know what? You're white, you're a white supremacist. And for all the white people who are saying, am I part of the problem stuff? Yes. <laughs> you are. <laughs> yes. A hundred percent. You are. You are. Because this is a white supremacist society. So you are imbibing that and you're getting that privilege 
whether or not you you think your father or mothers were connected to racial slavery, because like Isabel Wilkerson and others teach us, racial slavery produces a caste system. So just by being white, not only do you have advantages, right? Not only do you have advantages, but people who are black have disadvantages, right? So the white suburbs are connected to black ghettos in the United States, historically and contemporaneously through policy, tax policy, public policy, the whole deal, the opportunity hoarding, the vaccine hoarding. Yes, this is part and parcel of white supremacy in the United States and globally, but it's really rooted in racial slavery. And what racial slavery does is create a caste system that has supply chains of power and privilege that white people are willing to murder other people for and a supply chain of grief and misery that usually black people are disproportionately connected to. In between, you're gonna have Latinx, uh, Asian, South Asian, all kinds of different people. And most people are trying to get to what? The supply chain that is filled with power and privilege. So when you think about white supremacy, of course, because it is so capacious, there's gonna be black people connected to it too. And Latinx people connected to, to it too. And people who are non-white who are saying, hey, yeah, they're white supremacists. They wanna be a part of that. That's why when we saw the MAGA and the white supremacist riot, uh, there, were, there were people who are non-white who are part of it. So uh, even going back to racial slavery, there were people who are non-white who are part of white supremacy. There were people who gave up slave rebellions and gave up slave insurrections, right? And that's what Malcolm teaches us about that in House Negroes versus Field Negroes in that speech, right? Yeah. Um, so it's 6.53. I think maybe we'll have time for me two more questions. Um, so I'm gonna cherry pick some of these. Um, so one of them is, with your vast knowledge about some of the darkest times in American history, do you still have faith in American democracy? Do you believe it can adapt to and reconcile with its true history? Well, I, I, I think I have faith in, in um, people who believe in American democracy and a different vision of American democracy. And, and I include myself in that. So I think that the, the Fannie Lou Hamers and the, the Ella Bakers and the Dr. Kings and Malcolm X, uh, what they were trying to do is, is transform and reimagine American democracy uh, and really confronting the huge traumas of the past and the present to try to um, achieve a different country, right? And again, that's you know, uh, you know, Eddie's book in terms of begin again, uh, and that's a quote of, of of from Baldwin that we we if we if we face you know not everything uh, that is uh, uh, you know confronted uh, can be can be you know can be won, but you've got to. You've got to face, you know, what, what you need to confront, or it's gonna it's gonna overwhelm you. So, um, yeah, I do think that we have this this great opportunity, and I've written about this extensively. We have this generational opportunity uh, in front of us to to try to eradicate um, racism and systems of racism, to try to defeat white supremacy, uh, and to and to build a different country. You know, um, but part of that means turning inward and realizing that uh, what Dr. King called for us a revolution of values where we have to call out um, the injustice and the violence um, that we see. We've seen a lot, a lot of evil, you know, things that we have to uh, describe in biblical terms, not over the last four years, but over the scope of American history. We've seen a lot of evil and black people have been the recipients of that evil, political, economic, cultural uh, evils, spiritual evils. And, and the only way to combat that is by acknowledging them uh, and setting up systems and safeguards to make sure that they can't uh, ever return. But we're very, very far away from all that. We, we don't even have a Voting Rights Act that protects people's right to vote against voter suppression, right? We, we, we don't have. And, and voter suppression and intimidation and just games that are being played uh, in, in so many different states and locales, especially where Black people are, where poor people are, where people of color are. So um, we, we absolutely have to be uh, hopeful, but we have a lot, a lot of work to do. Uh, and that work, um, you know, obviously a big start is educating, but then uh, in addition to education, we have to be active and we have to organize. Perfect. And then um, just a curious question from a person, what's next on your writing desk? Mm. 
I'm working on a couple of books. I mean, one is on this idea of third reconstruction and, and you know, basically the way we live now and what that means. And another is a book on uh, 1963 as well in the civil rights movement. So I'm, I'm, I'm busy uh, here. And so all of this as a historian has obviously um, moved me, um, but, but I'm, I'm, always, um, I'm always a believer that the deeper we understand um, the history of, of what we're facing, uh, the greater the opportunity we have to transform it. Because you know, history is not, not past, it's really the present. You know? History is, is, is shaping the narratives we tell ourselves about ourselves, all of us are connected to this because we all have family histories. We all know our mothers and our aunts and uncles and grandfathers who give us a narrative and that actually informs who we are. And so all of the cities we live in, the states, the institutions we belong to, the nation um, has a history that informs us to this day. So it's really important for us to be aware of that history. And I think it's positive. One of the uh, best outcomes of what's happened over the last year is that more people uh, are receptive to wanting to understand that history and teach that history to their kids, to their networks. That's very, very Im important, right? So I think I think that's that gives me hope as well. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Joseph, for um, your insight and expertise, um, and thank you all for joining us tonight at SAMA virtually at home. <laughs> um, and with that, I'll close it out. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. All right. Bye, everybody.